complexity. And uh, of course, we also have to think about how we're actually going to do these improvements and how we actually resample our data intelligibly. And so I think all of these areas are very interesting uh, research areas to look into. Uh, today, I'll just talk about two of these areas. So I'll talk about some work we looked at in, pre in sort of these semantically useful distributions and um, some on interpretability for, uh, in the model complexity area. Okay, so uh, just an outline. So first I'll talk about these two projects and then afterwards I'll talk a little bit about my vision for future work. Okay, so in this first project, we're looking at dynamic word representations uh, and its use in data mining applications. Uh, and this was a uh, sort of summer project work we did at Technicolor. Okay, so if we've ever worked in natural language processing, we kind of know that you know, there are a lot of different tasks in natural language processing, whether it's text summarization or, mach or machine translation or sentiment analysis, and they can kind of be broken down to small subtasks, like you know, part of speech, speech classification, for example. Um, and in all of these applications, we have to sort of find a way to take words as inputs and something as output. And so how do you actually take a word and represent it as a number? It's not really clear, right? So the easiest way to do this is to take a giant vector, which is the size of the number of words in the English language, and say, OK, that vector is all zeros with a 1 if that word is being selected and 0 otherwise. And so we can see a lot of problems evolving here, right? So for example, let's just say that we wanted to use a neural network classifier. Then the first layer of the neural network has 170 uh, for its first, first dimension in terms of the number of parameters. And then it sort of reduces down to something like 20 or 30 in the end. So something like this is very hard to train. And even if you could train it, it's going to overfit quite a bit. So it's really not an ideal thing to do. So what do people do? People use word vectors. So what are word vectors? They're basically ways of representing words in low dimensional space. And so actually, if we look back over here, uh, this seems like a really strange way to represent words because this vector in itself has very little like uh, d degrees of freedom, right? We have, we're, we're just sort of saying that everything has to be all zeros with one one. It's not, it's not really using the entire 170,000 dimensional space very well. So if, if instead we take these words and we represent them in a much lower dimensional space, but in a word that geometrically captures some language structure, we might be able to do a lot better. And so these word vectors, what they'll actually produce is words living in something like 50 dimensional or 100 dimensional space, where words with similar meanings cluster together. And you also get interesting algebraic sort of uh, structures. For example, the orientation of the vector of man minus woman is the same as uncle minus aunt and king minus queen. And so these sort of things make you, f make you uh, feel like these vectors are actually somehow geometrically capturing language structure. So why is that useful? Now we actually take these word vectors and we put them through a neural network. This neural network becomes much easier to train. And in fact, the performance will become much better. And so you see quotes like, so the use of word re uh, representations is called a secret sauce for the success of many L NLP systems in recent years across tasks. Um, so, you know, name entity recognition, sentiment analysis, all of these things across all these tasks. Just by replacing the word with the word vector, you can usually do better. Okay, so we're actually going to take this a step further and use these word vectors for something slightly different. So we know that word ve words in general are not a static quantity, right? They're changing over time. They have sort of emerging meanings and dying meanings, right? So old words fall out of use, new words come into use. And we also have a lot of words like, you know, names of brands or names of people that are constantly changing their association as that brand and person changes association. And so actually, this is one of the big motivations of this work, which is uh, if I'm McDonald's and I know that in 1960, my company was associated with family friendly environments and like nice, you know, dinners going out. And in 2012, it's associated with obesity and hypertension. Uh, I really need to know this so I can keep rebranding, right? And same with politicians. So this handsome gentleman to the bottom here is Barack Obama, or former President Barack Obama, long before he was president. And so, you know, People, you know, sort of keeping track of these associations can actually be done through these word vectors, and it actually can um, help them with their tasks. So, okay. So the goal of this first project is asking: Can we actually track word vectors through time to show concept evolution? Okay. So we have to take a step back now and actually to talk about how we're actually computing these word vectors. So let's first look at the static case. So in this case of static vectors, the way we do it is we sort of form what's called a co-occurrence matrix. So the co-occurrence matrix, basically, you take a really, really long corpus, and then you go through and you do some pre-processing. So you discard words that are appearing too often but really aren't that informative. And you sort of discard like rare words that don't appear much at all. 
And then you use a sliding window and just slide through the entire corpus. And every time two words appear in the same sliding window, you add a count. So then you form this sort of, uh, sort of second order count of everything going on in the, in the corpus. And the assumption here is that this co-occurrence matrix acts as a similarity matrix. So there's this famous quote in linguistics, like you shall know a word by a company it, it keeps. So words that sort of fall, like words that are near other words in space are somehow similar to each other in meaning. So if I just take this matrix just the way it is, and I do some kind of factorization on it, for example, I take the top singular vectors of it, already I can do a lot of amazing things. And so this, this result is from 1990s. They just took uh, you know, a, a fairly sizable corpus, and then they just did an SVD on it. And already they can do a lot of clustering, like parts of the body, animals, and places with like some mistakes. So tooth is sort of in the wrong cluster. But they actually do very well just by that very simple procedure. So this tells us that maybe this assumption that words appear together are similar is actually probably very true. Um, so how has the technology changed since then? Well, one issue that people notice is that the English language is highly unbalanced. So we have a few words that appear almost all the time, and most words don't appear much at all. And so this makes the co-occurrence matrix kind of unstable. It's not very, like, you know, you have some, words, some numbers that are way too big, and then everything else gets squashed. OK, so we just do the typical tricks we usually do in this kind of scenario. We do some weighting. We divide by the frequency. And then you know, we do the typical trick we do when we don't want big numbers to be too big. We just take the log. Right? And so now it looks kind of like a mutual information, paralyzed mutual information matrix. And then one issue people realize when they actually start working with this matrix is, OK, so if I have words that basically don't occur at all, it's basically 0. So I look at this weighted co-occurrence matrix. That value is close to 0. That's fine. I take the log of it, it becomes something negative, very, very, very negative. And so that actually starts throwing things off. So when you barely, see, we barely have enough samples, you have very, very large numbers. And so what they do is they just threshold it at zero. So in reality, what you're really working with is the PPMI matrix, so the positive pairwise mutual information matrix. And this is what we're going to use to represent similarity between words. OK, so I then take this matrix. And I do some kind of factorization. So I do some way of making it into this sort of U, U, T structure. And then this matrix here, each row of this matrix is then my word embedding. And this, this technique is actually pretty much how most word embeddings are created in some way or another. Right? So sort of to, to get to the solution, it's the solution of a non-convex optimization problem. So how you actually go about solving it will affect the quality of your solution. But ultimately, each of these different methods, they're trying to get to this in a different way. So you know, in the past, they, they look at these counts matrix. But more recently, you look at the PPMI matrix. So whether you're doing an SVD, whether you're doing a shallow neural network, or whether you're doing least squares problem, they're all sort of trying to do this kind of matrix factorization. And they, they will actually get different performances on different tasks because they are using different ways of getting there. Okay. So that's how the static case works. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to do concept evolution, right? We're trying to understand how words change their meaning over time. So the simplest way it seems to do that is we take this corpus and we slice it into time frames. And for each time frame, we just do the same thing, right? We just do the same thing we did for the static embeddings. We do some kind of factorization. We look at these vectors and we see what happens. OK, so unfortunately, this will not work. So what's wrong with why won't this work? Um, so there's some kind of basically rotational invariance when it comes to matrix factorization. So uh, basically, you can think about it as if I told you the, the distances between all the different nodes in a configuration, that tells you the configuration, but it doesn't tell you the rotation or the translation, right? So if I take two different time frames and I do this kind of matrix factorization, the meaning may not have changed, but the vector will change quite a bit if I don't account for this rotational invariance. Right, so this vector over here jumped over here, but in fact, it, the meaning didn't change. So for dynamic word representations, uh, most of the works, they differ by basically telling you how they actually go about enforcing this smoothing, so dealing with this rotational invariance. That's basically the, the main mathematical part of it. Um, so for example, so the first, so I'll, I'll sort of go through a couple different examples. One example, uh, the first way they did it is they basically said, OK, give me the word you want to look for, and I'll just do that kind of rotation in time. So what they have is they have one corpus, which is very well sampled, and that's their base time corpus. And then now you give me a new year. So instead of cat in 1990, I want to look at cat in 2016. And I look at the word cat, and I look at the words close to that. So maybe dog, you know, turtle, pet, all these different things. And then I just take this 
configuration here and rotate it back in real time. And the hope is that, for the most part, this configuration is, is the same. You have a couple words that have changed meanings, but most of the words have not changed meanings. So how am I going to do this rotation? I'm going to solve this optimization problem here. So I'm going to just basically minimize this distance with some sort of orthogonal matrix here. And so this problem here is called the Procrustes problem. It actually has some interesting history. So Procrustes is this Greek, uh, I guess, highwayman. He used to go around and like collect people and bring and basically convince them to come to his home. And in his home, he had a bed that was an odd shape. And he would tie people down to his bed. And if they didn't fit, he would cut off their arms and legs or he would stretch them out. And so he was a, was a Greek serial killer. <laughs> and mathematicians decided that the best name for this problem was the Procrustes problem. <laughs> So, so yeah, so, so basically this method works by solving a series of very, very small scale Procrustes problems in real time. Okay, so that, that's nice for some reasons. First of all, every problem you need to solve is really small, right? It's just the word and its neighbors. It's really not that big. Uh, but it's bad because you have to do all this stuff in real time, right? Every time I want a new word, I need to do this computation again. So it can be a little snow, slow. And also, it runs into problems if, for some reason, this base time corpus wasn't good enough. If you didn't sample it well enough, then, then you might have some noise here. So you won't get a good meaning. But it's, it's definitely one valid way of doing it. Uh, sort of the, the medium approach is to, instead of just rotating one word and its neighbor at a time, I can actually just rotate the entire uh, matrix at a time. I would only have to do it one time, and then I would never have to do it again. So it's not a real-time computation. Uh, it's a slightly bigger problem to solve. Um, so instead of a word and its neighbors, we're looking at the entire corpus. Uh, but uh, there's another issue with it is that you didn't really take care of this undersampling problem. So if I want to look at these three timescales here, I'm going to take this timescale, I'm going to rotate it here, I'm going to take this one, I'm going to rotate it here. Okay, what happens if this was a badly sampled year? So if this was a badly sampled year and I force this to, to fit here, this one will have a lot of noise. And then here, this one will have a lot of noise. So you see a lot of issues between the alignment of t equals 3 and t equals 1, because you're sort of forcing it to fit you know, a noisy um, configuration. OK, but uh, this actually also, you know, it's very you know, sound and actually works very well, too. But the method that we're going to push is this method here. So we're going to solve this much larger optimization problem. And then instead of solving a series of Procrustes problems, we're just going to do it all at once. We're going to sort of deal with all of these alignments all at once. And the main reason is because now we're not forcing these things to be exactly the same. We're just forcing them to be close. And this actually will help a lot with this issue of what happens if one of these years is undersampled. Um, so of course, we have trade-offs. So the trade-off is that now, instead of solving smaller problems, we are solving the biggest problem. Right? So this one was sort of medium, but this one is very big. We're looking at all the time scales. Uh, and so the hope is that we can kind of come up with some way of doing this in a large scale setting. Um, and actually, the solution to that is quite simple. What we do is we end up using black coordinate descent. So this is the problem we want to solve. What we do is we first reformulate it. So we break the symmetry. So actually, if you're familiar with black coordinate descent, what we're trying to do here is for each one of these variables, we're going to pick one time slice. I'm going to minimize this. Fixing all the time slices, we're just going to solve for one time slice. So doing that over here is fine. This is just sort of a quadratic problem. Doing it over here is really hard because this is a quartic problem, right? So finding a solution of a, of a quartic polynomial is much harder than finding the solution for a quadratic one. So what we do is we break the symmetry. We just sort of take one of these u's, we turn it into v, and then we set u equals v. So it's a very sort of common trick. Uh, you add that trick, so you break the symmetry here. You add this regularizer here. You have two smoothing terms here. And then you add two more regularizers for good conditioning. And then this entire problem for one time slice is actually fairly easy. It's just the solution of a least squares problem. So we do this. Uh, we do some grid searching for all of these different parameters, so tau and lambda and gamma. And then we just run it for the, the number of epochs until the solutions look nice. And so this is, the, uh, this is the problem we're going to, this is the way we're actually going to do our dynamic word embeddings. And now we're going to apply it to a corpus. So the corpus we pick is the New York Times, like 1990 to 2016. Uh, we have about 100,000 articles, 59 sections. Uh, we go through and we do some pre-processing. We remove all stop words and rare words. Um, ultimately, we end up with a vocabulary size of about 21,000. So. Okay. So just to give some results. Uh, so this is actually the concept evolution of the word apple from 1990 to 2016. 
So uh, one thing we noticed right away, we really thought that the New York Times was a very neutral like corpus. We figured it would just tell us the meaning of the word. It's still corpus specific. New York Times, when you're talking about Apple, is in 1990s about recipes, right? It's about the home and family life kind of thing. And so most of what you see here are ingredients. And then over time, they turn into things like tablet, iPod, iPhone, and then Google, Microsoft, Samsung. Um, similarly, with Amazon, it started out with the rainforest. Then it goes into sort of uh, e-commerce. And then nowadays, it's more about content consumption. And so you can actually see these things shift over time. Uh, one really fun thing to do is to see what happens with people. Uh, so Barack Obama, 1990 to 2006, he's associated with his more academic self, right? University professor. And then later on, more towards his presidential life. Uh, President Trump, similarly, starting out with sort of owner estate, more like you know, fine, you know, real estate type of things. That's the only that's where he usually makes the news. And then more recently, you know, making the news in many other ways. So it's actually would be quite interesting to extend this to 2019, but unfortunately, it, we did this project in 2016. <laughs> so. But it would be very interesting to see what happens since. Uh, one thing we were actually able to do in this project is change point detection. So in data mining, one thing we care about is not just sort of how the concept is going along, but when does the concept change from one to another. So for example, for presidents, uh, we can see. So basically what we did here is we, we noticed that the vector norm is very closely correlated with the frequency of the word. But because of our smoothing terms, uh, it's much less noisy than frequency when used as change point detection. So in the past, what you would do is you would do some count-based method. You would count how many times these words appear. Say, OK, well, we think that this is when the change point happened, but it's hard to tell because of all of these spikes. Uh, another issue that comes up is if you're looking at concepts that sort of are, are not like the same in terms of magnitude, you tend to see one concept like completely uh, overshadowing all the other concepts, and it can actually make them disappear. What we found with vector norms is that the vector norms that we compute are much more robust against this. And so we see things like we can actually detect when did a president occur. You know, this is first Clinton, and then Hillary Clinton is over here. We see you know first Bush, second Bush, and uh, you know Obama and Trump here rising at the end. Um, similarly, with these concepts, we can kind of detect them rising and falling um, a little more steadily. And so this looks like it might be actually a very a useful tool for you know change point detection and data mining. Uh, actually, the task that we ended up uh, sort of trying and then we sort of decided we didn't want a more complicated optimization problem to deal with is this task here, where what we're trying to do here is basically uh, we give you a word, so Obama in 2016, and we ask you what is the closest word in every other year. And from that, we can uh, basically like detect the, the correct president for all the different years. And this is actually pretty robust against parameter tunes or number of epochs or anything like that. We can almost always recover the correct president. Uh, we did the same thing with the New York, Time, the New York City mayor. Uh, and we basically almost correctly recovered all of them. There was, uh, in 2006, we didn't get any people's names at all. And in 2011, we got Cuomo, who is the governor of New York. So it was actually pretty close. Uh, so we were pretty like we were pretty surprised by this. We thought, oh, we really created something magical. We thought about it for a long time. We thought, okay, there may be one reason why this is happening, which is that the New York Times is a pretty like respect respectful newspaper, right? When they say a president's name during his presidency, he, they always preface it preface it with president. So all these words are being pulled towards president very closely over time. And the same thing with New York City mayor. So we thought, OK, we really need to give it a real challenge, right? We need to give them a, a question that doesn't have a title associated to it. So we asked it, OK, tell me something about tennis. Right? So we, we never think about tennis players with titles, right? So, I mean, we don't call them with, by their titles. So we gave it a question, OK, so ATP number one ranked male player. Uh, and then tell me who, who, is, you know, who is that player for each year. And the bolded ones are the correct answers. The non-bolded ones are not correct answers. But they're all tennis players. So it kind of got close, but it, it wasn't answering the question exactly. But it was actually giving a, you know, a ballpark answer in each case. Um, so this was sort of, uh, yeah, this is sort of the, the more, I guess, uh, more honest uh, question answering task that we put it through. Okay. So just to sort of give a conclusion on this project, uh, word vectors, uh, they're a way of representing words in a geometrically intuitive way. 
And they're usually used for pre-processing for natural language processing tasks. And the way to compute this is basically variance of matrix factorization on some similarity matrix, which is usually some uh, linear trans or some, some transformation of the co-occurrence matrix. Uh, so we have uh, dynamic word vectors, which can be used to track concept evolution. And we can do this by basically computing word vectors over time slices, but we have to do something to correct for rotational misalignment. And this is the same with dynamic word vectors and also with sort of cross-corpus uh, word vectors. If we're trying to look at this, the similarity between like two words from two different sources, you know, say New York Times and MSN, we would have to do the same sort of thing. Uh, and then we showed some results on New York Times corpus, which, you know, we can look at word trajectories or change point detection or question answering. Um, so I want to pause here to ask if there are any questions on this. Yeah. Yes. So that, that, that's what we did. Although, so the results I showed are what we would call qualitative results. We do also have quantitative results. So quantitative results are a little trickier in NLP because usually you come, you propose it and then you make it public, but then you validate on it because there just aren't that many like test brains out there. But for example, one that we did was uh, we looked at the association of words uh, to each other according to what section they appeared in. So we sort of think of that as a two, com two completely different ways of associating words, and then we see how well they match up. So, you can, yes. If Sampras comes as way back, right? yes. he was not very, he didn't win one year, then you probably can provide this information, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's, it is, but uh, yeah, so, so, so we can do so this for a number of questions. Line, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if we do. Re oh, okay. Refresh, it's called, refresh algorithm is called refresh. It's a reinforcement, you have to basically pick it back and learn it. Oh. oh. It, it, it's called reinforcement. <laughs> Oh, okay. Sorry. Reinforcement learning. Right. Meaning so, refreshes algorithm by go one of the guys in Google. I mean, Stanford or Google, whatever. Yeah. So I think um, if, if the task is actually question and answering, reinforcement learning is exactly the way to go. Uh, we were using question and answering more of a way of evaluating how good are uh, embeddings, which, uh, we, or sorry, we were, yeah, we were using yeah, question and answering for that task. So I think it, we wouldn't really want it to cheat by being able to resample the question. But definitely for question and answering in general, that would be the way to go. Yeah, so thank you. So now I'll move on to the second project. Um, so this project is a little bit changing gears. Uh, it's more about machine learning interpretability and understanding how solvers are actually working. Um, so finite support identification and proximal methods. So the goal here now is to solve a sparse optimization problem, which we will frame as f is a convex function and l smooth, meaning that the gradients, you know, it, it can't differ too much, right? So if, if x and y don't differ too much, and the gradient can't differ too much. Um, lambda here is some regularization parameter provided to us by the application. And this last term here, the L1 norm, is the sum of the absolute values of x. And so here, f of x is usually posing as a loss function. And it's sort of this constraint here is used as some kind of regularization for model complexity. So problems of this form appear in many applications like signal processing, uh, image recovery, bioinformatics. In machine learning, uh, this kind of problem is used to basically prevent models from over, overfitting. Right? So we know that if we're trying to separate x's from o's, we can do so by sort of drawing a straight line, or we can use a really curvy line that perfectly separates the two data sets. But we actually want the simple model because that's the one that's going to work better on data we haven't yet seen. Right, so that works fine on our training data, but that's not really what we're interested in. So there's a lot of ways of actually reducing model complexity, but for ex the, one, the one that we'll focus on here is basically by adding this L1 regularizer, which forces x to be sparse. Right? So if you're forcing most of the vector to be zero, then you're forcing model simplicity. But you're sort of letting the algorithm choose which ones are zero, which ones are non-zero. Okay, and so, uh, one application where sort of sparse optimization is useful um, is in feature selection. So in feature selection, what you're trying to do is you're not actually trying to optimize the solution and figure out what the final vector x is. You're just trying to understand the support. You just want to know what are the indices of x where xi star is non-zero. 
So why would we want to do that? So maybe in gene expression, uh, I just want to know which genes are responsible for some kind of uh, you know, for some kind of expression. So I want to know what genes cause breast cancer. I don't really care how strong they are. I just want to know which ones they are. Or drug efficacy, I want to know you know what kind of drugs looking into to actually you know present, prevent some disease. Right? I want very few number of drugs. I don't want a huge cocktail. But at this point, maybe I don't want to know their levels. And object detection here, right? So in this sort of large image, I only need one dot here, one dot here, one dot here. I don't need to know what's going on in the rest of the image. So there's a lot of sort of sparse optimization problems where I don't actually care about the result. I just care about the sparsity pattern. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve these uh, problems using what's called a proximal method. So the proximal method relies on this proximal operator here which is a vector-to-vector -vector map. And so it's basically the solution to this optimization problem. But for our purposes, we just care about the one norm here, where the proximal operator for the one norm is acting as a shrinkage operator. So it takes a vector, it looks at every element. If that element is greater than t, it subtracts t. If that element is smaller than minus t, it adds t. Everything else is squashes to zero. So it's trying to squash things close to zero. So you can see in this sort of two-dimensional example, uh, if you have this vector all the way out here, you're sort pulling it back at the x equals y direction. Over here, you're pulling it, it hits the axis, and then it snaps at zero. So you can see why a method that uses a proximal operator will generally get you sparse solutions, right? So it tries to get to zero. Once it gets to zero, it just snaps at zero and stays there. So we're going to try to characterize the snapping behavior a little more. OK, so proximal methods are methods that repeatedly call the proximal operator on something that depends on the past. And so there's a large family of proximal methods. The one that we see most often is the proximal gradient method. Um, so it's also, you know, if, if h here is a constraint, it becomes a projected gradient method. So they're basically the same method. Uh, but so this method is used very often in practice. Uh, there are variations on this. For example, using acceleration, so you get FISTA method. And then uh, you can also look at things like douglas Rashford method and ADMM. And these are all sort of uh, types of proximal methods. And these all methods. Uh, one thing we've observed in practice is that when you run any of these methods on some kind of sparse optimization problem, uh, most of the time they will identify the sparsity pattern very early. Right? So if you look at the error in the residual, it'll sort of keep going down forever. If you look at the error in the support, it'll just hit over here some finite time and it'll stop. And at that point, you've, you've discovered the correct support and it stays there. So this is great for us because it says that, OK, our task is to actually just identify the support of something. Uh, why don't I just run a proximal method, run it for 100 iterations, and stop? As long as I know that in 100 iterations, I have the right support, I don't need to run it to completion. And so yeah, so this is sort of what we're trying to do. And often, we only care about the red curve. Uh, here's another example. So in this task, what we're trying to do is separate fours from nines and hand-rated digits. Uh, we won't do too much pre-processing here. We'll just take these raw images and apply uh, sparse logistic regression. So here, I've plotted the objective error. And uh, at each point, we can also look at the feature, right? So the so feature here is sort of, it's always in two dimension because this data here is in two dimension. And you can actually see which features are being selected. And you can see after a while, uh, you start to see like this feature coming up the most, right? That feature sort of corresponds to the ridge in the 49, right? So. Um, when we're looking at fours and nines, right? This guy here is actually really important. Um, so that thing is starting to light up here. And we notice that uh, basically we're able to discover this pretty early on. So each of these images, the title of these images, contain the train error and the test error. And what we notice is that both of them level off very early on. Uh, in machine learning, there's this problem of we don't really know when to stop because we know that these performance metrics tend to level off pretty soon, even when the objective error hasn't gone to zero. And I think it's still an open problem. But one thing we do know is that we can tell you when the support has been identified. And at that point, you know, maybe that's a good indication of when we should stop because the support is actually identified pretty early on. So, any questions yet? Okay. okay. So now we're going to try to characterize all of this mathematically. So we're going to just say that a method with iterates xk to x star identifies the support at iteration bar k if for all k greater than bar k, xik is equal to 0 whenever xi star is equal to 0. And this seems like a little bit of a one-sided definition of support, but actually it's, it's the side that we can prove. Um, so the question that we're going to ask in this, in this, uh, in this part is, 
Do, is it true that all proximal methods identify the support in finite iterations? Can we actually show that this is provably true? Uh, and the answer is often it's true, but sometimes it's false. And if we actually look through the literature, we'll see basically uh, all the authors, they take a method, they analyze it you know, to death, they introduce things like differential geometry and all these different tools, and they tell you something about that method. Uh, but in fact, we can say something across the board. We don't really have to look at each method separately. We can actually say something just knowing that they're all using the operator. Uh, and this will help us a lot because it will help us understand um, not so much a method-dependent metric, but a data-dependent metric on when the support uh, can be identified. So. Okay, so the key thing that we need to know here is to how to actually solve this problem. Like, what are the optimality conditions for solving this optimization problem? So let's look at each individual uh, index of x separately. So we take one xi and we say, okay, at the solution, xi star is not zero. If it's not zero, then this L1 term over there is smooth. And so I know that the gradient is, uh, is going to be zero at the optimum, right? So we're in this first case here. We know the gradient is zero. Then we set everything equal to zero and we do some algebra and we get that that basically means that if xi star is negative, then if I define z star as the negative gradient, then z i star is negative lambda. If x i star is positive, then z i star is lambda. That's just sort of done by taking everything and setting it to zero. Then what happens if x i star is zero? Well, then we know that it's sort of, uh, you know, it's like it has this absolute value, right? It's at the cusp of this absolute value that's being tilted this way or this way by the smooth term. But you can't tilt it too far, because if you tilt it too far, then the minimum is no longer at zero, right? It'll sort of roll off. So how far can you tilt it? Well, you can tilt it from minus lambda to lambda. So these three conditions exactly quantify that x is optimal. So if x i star is satisfying all these three conditions, we know that it's the solution of that problem. We can actually sort of plot it here. So we have x i star. And then if z star is, or x star here, and z star is the negative gradient, basically if x star is positive, then z star must be sort of all the way up to lambda. Otherwise, it must be all the way down to minus lambda. And if xi is 0, then it has to be somewhere in the middle, but it doesn't really know where. So if we can show that this kind of, uh, if, we, if, we, if you give me an x, and I plotted the x and the negative gradient, and it looked like that, then I tell you for sure that this is the correct solution. We don't have to do any more work. OK, so the lemma that we give in here is uh, basically, we, we call it the wiggle room lemma. We sort of tell you that this is sort of how much error you're allowed to have and still be able to identify the support correctly. So we have this sort of data dependent quantity, so delta min, and basically we say that for any algorithm of this form here, then we know that at some iteration k, the correct support is identified if this residual here is smaller than this data dependent constant. Okay, so this is sort of a mouthful. Uh, let's look a little bit intuitively what that means. Okay, so that's the condition we need to be true. At some, uh, and then so we're going to define delta i as the gap between any of these zi's to the end, right? So we know that if x i star is zero is non-zero, then this gap is zero. So that doesn't that's not really interesting. When x i star is zero, there's some gap, and we're going to measure that gap. And the smallest one of these gaps is delta min. Then at some iteration k, we have a noisy x, and that gives us a noisy k. Right, so that noisy x, how, how much noise can we still have and still have the condition be satisfied? Well, if xi, if, if xi star is zero, we are not allowed any noise, right? any amount of noise, and it could sort of break our condition. But if xi star is non-zero, then we're allowed exactly delta min amount of noise. If we have just that little bit amount of noise, we can know that for whatever xi star is zero, the condition is still met. And so then at that point, the support is identified. So basically, uh, so Basically, what this uh, condition is saying is that if basically all the noise in the gradient is smaller than this delta min, then we have identified the support. Okay, so how can we actually use this lemma to give some kind of support identification complexity rate? Okay, so how we actually use this lemma? So this is the condition we need to be true. We take our method and we insert yk according to the algorithm. So for projected gradient descent, yk is just the current iterate subtracting the gradient. We sort of plug it into this part here and sort of rearrange terms. And we see that this term here breaks into one term that's the error in the variable and one term that's the error in the gradient. 
So this already tells us that finite support recovery will happen when delta min is positive, because we know that xk eventually converges to x star, and the gradient eventually converges to the true gradient. So convergence basically means that at some point that the amount of error has to be smaller than this delta min term. And so to figure out how far it goes, we just sort of need to sort of we go through literature and we find the, our favorite rate of how xk actually converges to x star. Uh, we use our assumption here to bound the gradient. And so, for example, in projected gradient descent, we know that, that if, uh, if uh, f of x here is strikes, then we have this kind of convergence rate here. We invert this to get k bar. And we see that the uh, active set complexity, or the support identification complexity rate is exactly log of delta min over this thing here. So here we're actually able to recreate uh, one of the previous rates, but we use you know, m many fewer lines to get there just by exploiting this wiggle room lemma. And so this is, this is how it works for uh, projected gradient descent. Uh, we can additionally use that same trick for all the other proximal gradient methods, uh, which is really sort of the strength of this, uh, this technique. And we're able to do it for accelerated gra proximal gradient, Douglas factor to ADMM, and also proximal Newtons, which as far as we know, hasn't previously been explored. Uh, and the, uh, so just, just to make everything fair, uh, the previous works that have looked at each of these, they have looked at each method separately and they've given a lot of different rates on a lot of different aspects of these methods. We're only looking at support identification. And because we're just looking at a small piece of the puzzle, we're able to do it for all of these methods in one broad stroke. Um, and using many simpler proofs. So. Okay, so that was nice, but uh, we really want to scale up, right? So most of us are probably not even using gradient descent anymore, we're just using stochastic gradient descent. So this is work in the stochastic gradient descent setting. So now instead of taking gradient steps, we're now taking stochastic steps. So basically what does that mean? At each iteration, we're going to, so the, the problem we're trying to minimize is actually a composite of different convex and smooth functions. We're going to pick one of these uniformly uh, at random at each iteration. We're going to take a gradient step, and then we're going to shrink it. And we know that basically that this method will, con oh, sorry, so we know that this method will converge, but we have an additional sort of constraint, which is that this step size has to decay, right? So the casting gradient descent, the step size has to decay, otherwise we won't converge. Um, okay, so we're going to try to do the same trick that we did previously. We're going to write out our residual term. We're going to organize it in terms of an error in the variable and the error in the gradient. And we're going to say, well, if both this term goes to zero, so basically, if this entire gradient term converges, higher variable error term converges, then we're fine. So does this term converge in general? So unfortunately, no, right? So we know that in general, um, so take for example, f of x equals x minus 1 squared plus x plus 1 squared. Then we know the solution is x star equals 0, but we know that the gradient of this part will be minus 1. The gradient of this part will be 1. The gradient of the whole thing will be zero, right? So in fact, they can't possibly uh, they can't possibly actually converge even when you've actually reached the true solution. So this is a big problem with stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so this this is not true in general. Um, the second step is actually still not true in general, right? So previously we said that okay, the variable will always converge to the true solution. But that was when we had a constant step size. When we use a decaying step size, if this decay is faster than the convergence of xk to x star, this term also doesn't go to zero. So in stochastic gradient descent, we're pretty like we're, we're pretty stuck. It doesn't really seem easy to prove that there is any kind of support identification. And in practice, we actually find that that's completely consistent with our observations. That that support identification does not happen for proximal stochastic gradient descent. Um, so here, we just sort of did a very small example. Uh, using constant step size, nothing converges. You must have a decaying step size, and then you can see that the variable will converge, but the sparsity error will not converge. And that's the same no matter what kind of decay rate you use. Um, so I think one thing to clarify here, uh, a question you might have is, OK, well, if the variable goes to 0, then why is it that the sparsity error doesn't go to 0? Well, so you can see if this is sort of the true sparsity pattern, uh, you might have something that's like this, right? So you might have a very, very small number here. This number might converge to zero, but it will never actually reach zero. So for first order methods, the methods we looked at before, they will actually reach exactly zero in finite time. But for stochastic methods, they, they just keep getting closer and closer. But they won't actually reach zero. Okay. 
So yeah, so are, are we sort of lost? Is there no hope? Uh, so luckily, there is hope. Uh, there's sort of a newer sort of stream of methods coming in, these variance reduced stochastic methods. And the way they kind of work is instead of taking these partial gradients, every once in a while, they'll take a full gradient. And because of that, they're sort of able to reduce the variance in each of these steps. And so you might say this is cheating. If I'm allowed to take a full gradient, why don't I just do full gradient descent? Uh, but actually, they do it so that the number of full gradients you take is like an uh, order less than the number you would take with full gradients and still achieve good convergence. So uh, anyway, so these, these methods are sort of, uh, yeah, they're coming out now. And then so there are a lot of advantages here when you actually have this variance reduced behavior. Uh, you can use constant step size. And also, you get support identification. And you get it fairly quickly. Um, so that's actually uh, shows that you know you can actually scale up and still get support identification, um, and we're actually able to prove it also using a wiggle room lemma uh, for the uh, variance reduced methods, but not for stochastic gradient descent. So this shows that our, our proof technique is somewhat consistent with what's observed in practice. Okay. So that's sort of uh, the main point here, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve this sparse optimization problem where we know the solution is sparse, so mostly zero. We're looking at a family of methods, these proximal methods, that we have observed in practice tend to lock onto the zeros early on, right? They tend to be able to identify the support early on. And so we characterize this using this wiggle room lemma, which we basically show using that geometric proof. And then from that lemma, we're able to give uh, the finite support complexity bounds uh, for deterministic proximal methods and for stochastic variance reduced proximal methods, but uh, not for stochastic gradient descent. Uh, instead, we just offer some intuition as to why it cannot happen. So this is sort of the second project. So uh, I'll pause here to ask if there are any questions here. Yeah, so this is, yes. Uh, yeah. So my question goes back to the slide where you were discussing about uh, the digit classification thing, wherein you were trying to uh, see what, how many are the minimum number of pixels you need to classify between four and nine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, there have been some work on this same thing, like uh, I read about recurrent attention models. So have you compared your results with the ones that Oh, they you mean with the uh, RNNs? A recurrent yeah. attention model, sort of, they yeah. use reinforcement learning to do image classification when they're trying to find the least number of pixels you require to classify whether a digit is two, three, four, or five. Yeah, I guess actually that probably works a lot better. This is less about trying to come up with a, like these, these are sort of, this is a very simple method that's very simple to run, like you could probably run it in two or three lines mm -hmm. that people are using mostly because it's easy to run. Yeah. But if your goal is to actually identify, you know, the sparsest support set, yeah. something like this would work a lot better, especially okay. if your images have sort of, you're trying to do something semantically. Yeah. So. You say the number of iterations. Yeah. Um, what does it really mean? I mean, the, what does 100 iterations versus 200 iterations mean? What is that? For you know, Take the, the example of that digit, right? Yes. What are we doing? Um, why are we stopping at 100, right? What he was saying. Yeah, so... Uh, I don't understand that part. I guess can... this, this chart is more to look at the relative difference between 300 iterations when the support is identified and, you know, 1,000 iterations when, you, when your solver might actually tell you this is an okay place to stop. Um, so the data... I mean, when I'm doing the iteration, yeah. what's your input and what's your output? So the input is the, well, it's like the, the 60,000 MNIST digits, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the output will be, you know, one if it's four and zero if it's okay. nine. Well, I guess, yeah, that, that breaks down to maybe 11,000 input digits. Um, yeah, this is just, I mean, I guess, I guess uh, if I were to use a different data set or if I use a different step size, I would get different number of iterations before any of this happens. So that's, that's definitely a good thing to keep, good point. Uh, I think the relative difference between when the support is identified and when the residual goes to zero is maintained. So, but it's, yeah, it's true. It's sort of the, the numbers is somewhat meaningless depending on the data set and depending yeah, on the sub size. Yeah. Unless you change more. Yeah, unless you change the sub size, yeah. So. Thank you for the questions. Okay. So I think uh, so now.
now I'll talk a little bit about sort of my vision for future projects to look at. OK, so we sort of looked in the first project how this kind of pre-processing trick of computing these word vectors uh, significantly helped uh, machine learning in general in the natural language processing world. Right? So we know that, first of all, in general, real world data is very diverse. And we know that we actually do a lot of pre-processing for a lot of different reasons, whether it's anonymization, encoding for robustness, but also in representational learning. Right? And so we know that, in fact, uh, each of these, like what we actually end up feeding into our classifier, the distribution of that data will affect how well our classifier works, whether it's you know things like you know separability or sort of incoherence. Uh, we would like to be able to characterize these better. And one thing we actually realized in sort of the second project is uh, we have this constant. Um, let's see if we can find it. Uh, this data dependent constant delta min here, which unfortunately depends on the solution of the problem. So it's data dependent in the sense that it does not depend on the method at all, but you can't ascertain this uh, without actually solving the problem at first. So it's a little bit unsatisfying. So one thing I think that really should be done is to try to understand how each of these constants uh, depend on the data. So um, that's sort of. Uh, the, this is sort of basically a very open question, but basically how, how does things like delta min or how does things like strong convexity or all these different uh, constants relate to things like the margin, the incoherence, all these different things. And there's been quite a bit of work on this already. So things like uh, you know, this, these papers in 2010 looked at things like restricted strong convexity, looked at things like uh, pseudo self-concordance as sort of uh, data dependent um, ways of characterizing how well the optimization will do. Uh, but I think there's a lot of more work to do in this area. So I think this is a, a very open question in general to look at. Um, and so you mentioned as well reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning kind of problems, or online optimization problems in general, pre present a very like twist to optimization. right? So we're trying to optimize this, this objective function, but f changes uh, according to the data. And you only observe the data one sample at a time. So so really here, our goal is not just to tell you how fast does a method converge, but how many samples do we have to see before the method converges. And so this is a very important problem in you know, band-based reinforcement learning, boosting, game theory. And you know, this is one of those areas where we know there are a lot of really nice techniques that can get us a good solution without seeing everything. But we don't uh, really have, you know, it's more, more of an art. It's more of an intuition of how to get there. Um, so just as an example, right, so in reinforcement learning, we're looking at things like we're trying to learn a policy or a Q function, which is parameterized by a sparse sum of basis functions. Uh, we want to know things like, what kind of basis functions should we use to actually characterize the whole state space? Uh, can we actually offer convergence guarantees based on sparse observations? How many observations do we need uh, for each kind of basis? So I think this is a, a very interesting open question still. Um, and so, you know, everyone these days is interested in deep learning. Uh, you know, of course, we should all be interested in deep learning because it's very much becoming a, a, such a big tool. Uh, and there's a lot of very interesting optimization questions here that are not yet being solved. So I don't know if you guys know about, uh, I, think, I think it was a 2016 test of time talk at NIPS where Ali Rahimi sort of gave a whole list of things about deep learning that we sort of know but we don't really know. Um, and so things on there like, uh, you know, batch normalization or dropout, um, other things I've seen people use a lot, like minimizing entropy to try to get like clustering activity. Um, these are all things that are not really standard optimization practices. And so, you know, while we understand a lot about how two norm regularization and one norm regularization gives us model complexity, or reduced model complexity, we don't know how these things give us reduced model complexity. And so we should, uh, you know, these are definitely things that we should look at more. I think even the simple question of the depth is not very well answered. We know that deeper networks have higher model complexity, but in general, people don't prefer just to have a really deep network. They need to have some trick to solve it, to train it. Otherwise, it's just impossible to train. So they do these things like highway networks, memory elements, attention networks. Uh, and those things are not sort of characterized in the you know, fundamental theory of the expressibility of deep neural nets. So that's something to look at. Uh, and probably the most popular optimization problem today in deep learning is these general adversarial networks, like the GANs. So we know that these GANs can sort of generate very interesting pictures from distributions. Uh, and we know that they're sort of framed as a saddle point problem or a two-player game, where one player uh, sort of offers um, some images, and the other player decides if this image is a real image or a generated image. And that's supposed to make both, both players better. 
But what usually happens is the first player gives a noise, and the other player, second player says, that's noise. Like, it correctly class noise. So this is a perfectly valid solution, but it's totally useless. And so the open question is sort of, how can we actually go about uh, sort of constructing these GANs to avoid this modal collapse problem? So uh, this is sort of a, a very important optimization problem. So, yeah, so thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, oh, are you willing to share uh, this lecture like, like, like private email or something? Yeah, I think it's actually... It's available on the high school on the yeah. page. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wait, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm just curious to know what are your uh, comments on the model complexity? versus the real-time update, like the over-the-air update that's been uh, recently been famous in stuff like autonomous vehicles, wherein if you have a model on the server and you want some real-time updates, do you actually focus more on the complexity of the model or you uh, weigh the, uh, what do you call, real-time update more than the accuracy? Like, what's it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm actually not very familiar with this recent work, so how does okay. this recent work, I mean, what are they discussing? Like, to put it in a simpler way, uh, would you uh, prefer the accuracy more or the latency more in terms of like real world cases? Yeah, I think that's the, uh, so as an optimization purpose, I would have to ask the machine learner which one is more important. Is the is new, is, is new data actually important? Because uh -huh. maybe it's because the user is reacting to the way the model is and mm -hmm. therefore it's very important. Or is it just sort of epsilon more samples, okay. in which case it's not that important. So. Okay. I would just have like some kind of question about you mentioned uh, anonymization and also clustering part. Yeah. Typically in healthcare, you have that huge issue of anonymization, and how would you do with price optimization and anonymization in this case? Because typically, if you can extract the vectors and the directions and how parallel they are, there's still information. Yeah, uh, yeah. That could actually make you retrieve the initial guess of what it is, right? Yeah, so one thing we did look at were sparse sketching matrices, but I'm not sure that actually uh, can effectively do what you're saying, but sparse sketching matrices would actually sort of, it's sort of the equivalent of multiplying it by a Gaussian random matrix, but where you don't lose sparsity, so you still have computational efficiency. But in fact, uh, it's actually not, it's actually still an open question to me is whether that's solving this privacy issue, because maybe you can still recover it. Um, Certainly wouldn't be easy to recover it, but yeah. But you um, will still have the relationships in between the. So typically, if I had yes. two two patients that have similar. Well, fears, you can you can specify it on the data side too, like sort of you have your data feature matrix. You can you can multiply by a random matrix on this side, or you can multiply on this side. If you multiply on this side, it seems like you would scramble up the users at least. To try. Does a finite support ID methods, because it's used for uh, proximal gradients, yes. it's used for ADMM, does it also use for like constrained gradient methods like Frank Wolf? Frank Wolf does have this, but it's not the same proof. It does have sparsity identified behavior. It's more because it's taking atoms one at a time and it stops when it has enough atoms, so usually it will pick the right ones first. But does this so. like Yeah, so the analysis would not be the same. That's actually one thing we're looking to extend to, but it's not the same because it's not actually using a proximal operator. It doesn't shrink. So it, it goes from the opposite direction kind of thing. So, but yes, the, the, it, Frank Wolf is very useful for this type of thing. Well, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank our speaker, Yifan Sun.